the next 10 minutes, while I talk, I want you to constantly take breaks and not pay attention to me and ask yourself how interesting this guy is. <laughs> this, of course, will destroy your ability to care about what I say, and it demonstrates how difficult it is to assess our thinking while we're thinking. But this is what we often ask people to do when we want to learn about engagement. In marketing, we have focus groups where people enjoy a movie, and just when the hero is about to make a choice, we pause the movie and we ask them, should she fall in love with the vampire or the wolf? And the reality is that there is some part of us that knows how things are engaging. It just we can't ask this part. That's our brain. So I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm also a business professor. And in the last couple of years, I've been interested in being interested. I wanted to know where in our brain lies this one site that comes to life when we care about something and is silent otherwise. Where is this uh, region of interest? And the answer was that after a tireless looking, we found nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, um, we couldn't find this area that kind of lights up when you care about something and is silent otherwise. But then, a few years ago, a colleague of mine, Professor Uri Hasson, came up with something interesting. He noticed that when people watch movies, their brains tend to synchronize as the movie goes along. They tend to look the same over time. And this suggested that maybe there is no one single area in the brain that codes our engagement, but maybe it's the entire brain and how similar it is across people that tells us how engaging it is. That is, how similar all of us are at the same time. Let me explain to you. When I talk to you right now, if I'm extremely boring, then maybe you think about your chores, and you think about a joke that you heard, and maybe you think about something you have to do tomorrow. The point is your minds wander in a different direction. But if I'm really, really interesting, then I somehow captivate all of your brains and make you all look alike. Strip you of your uniqueness. It doesn't matter if you are a man, a woman, extrovert, introvert, you all would look alike. Basically, I make you totally not unique. My grandfather used to tell us, uh, you're very unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> and that is essentially what engaging content does to us. It makes us all look alike. This is, in many ways, the definition of a genius. When Mozart, Picasso, or Spielberg were sitting in their studios and composing a symphony or stroking a brush on a canvas, somehow they were able to penetrate all of our brains decades later in different locations with different backgrounds and make us all look alike. Importantly, it doesn't mean that we like the content. We could look alike even if we hate it. So imagine yourself driving in a highway and there's a car accident on the right, left. You might not want to be there, but you can't not see that. It kind of makes you all look alike because it captivates your attention. So my student and I wanted to create a way to measure that, to create content that's so engaging that we can see how similar their brains are. And here is the problem. Scientists are notoriously not engaging. Um, it's really hard for our lab experiment to be uh, fun. Uh, usually people fall asleep really easily. It's good if you're trying to do sleep studies, but not if you're trying to do engaging <laughs> studies. So we were troubled. And then, like most science things, luck struck one day. I was giving a talk here in Chicago about my interest in interest. And at the end of the talk, a woman came to me and says, my name is Lita Steffi, and I'm the VP marketing of AMC theaters. And I'm interested in engagement, because we show movie trailers before every movie, and we don't know how to translate what people care about in the trailers to what they are going to watch six months later. Maybe there's a way to do something there. So my student, Sam Barnett, and I partnered with AMC Theaters, and for one month, we closed a movie theater here in Chicago. And for that month, everyone who came to the theater was told that they can't watch a movie regularly, but they can participate in a project where we're going to study their brains while they're watching movies. So people sat in the theater, like you guys, and we put some uh, device on their head called EEG that measures their brain activity and try to see how similar their brains are while they're watching movies. Now, EEG measures the activity from the outside, but it looks at the activity of cells on the inside. If you were to uh, zoom inside a person's brain, what you will see is a forest of little cells like the ones you see here, and when they speak, the language is the language of electrochemical signals. It sounds like this. This is one cell telling another, I care about a memory, a thought, an experience. And if we look at many of them at the same time, you can see how similar the brains of multiple people are. 
So we did just that, and what we learned quickly is that the trailers that made all the brains look alike were the ones that people actually remembered more afterwards, they were the ones that people cared about more, and the ones that they wanted to actually go see afterwards. Here's an example. What you see at the top is a picture of a brain with blue dots. Those blue dots are the places where all the brains of everyone looked alike. When little of the brain was similar, the trailer wasn't that engaging and people didn't care about it that much, compared to a trailer that made all the brains look alike, that then ended up being the one people remembered afterwards, cared about, wanted to pay more, and ultimately, six months later, end up going seeing the movie. So we found a way to look at similarity between brains and predict something about your behavior afterwards without the need to stop and ask you. But then it became even more interesting, because then we said, let's see if we can look at differences. At AMC theaters, there's this clip that they show before every movie um, where you know, they tell something about what you can expect. And what you see in this yellow line is the similarity between brains of everyone. The higher it is, the more engaging, the more similar the brains are. And essentially, what you can see here is nothing. Flat line, nothing interesting happens here. The clip seems like no one is really engaged. Then my student had the idea to have the computer take all the brains and separate them into two groups. Cluster them by how different they are. So everyone inside one group looks the same, but very different to the other group. And then the computer by itself figured out that the best way to cluster them was by gender. So now you're seeing the same clip as before, the same data, just broken by two groups. I'll let you figure out yourself who are the men and who are the women in this example. <laughs> and exactly, uh, of all the brains in this study, the ones that were most dissimilar were mine and my then girlfriend. Uh, because uh, one day my students called me and said, we're missing two subjects, can you come and participate? And I convinced her to join me, only to learn that it was Valentine's Day, and the movie we watched was Robocop. So here's a way to know that a lousy date is about to happen. So this metric works, and then we try to see if we can apply it to things. So first, we had the idea to look at Super Bowl ads. Those cost about $4 million for 30 seconds, and we tried to see if we can shorten them a little bit, making the engagement the same. Success. Then we looked at uh, YouTube videos. We partnered with Google and we took all the clips that you see before you see what you wanted to see, like the Justin Bieber clip here, and tried to predict after five seconds of viewing how similar the brains are and maybe what will not be skipped. We worked with investors, like in Shark Tank, and tried to see if we can predict just looking at their brains what they're going to invest in and how much money. We looked at fans of football teams and tried to see how they're feeling when their team loses uh, big time. We looked at storytellers. We even looked at your brain when you're sleeping, most science experiments, and tried to see what happens to content that goes into your brain. We even were able to answer the old debate whether it's better to be in the concert live or to listen to the same music at home with your great speaker system. The answer, live. But it became really important and apparent that it's more than just a simple tool when the election came in 2016. Because we could start looking at the brains of individuals who were looking at the debates, and what we saw was that we can't tell who you're going to vote for by looking at your brain, but we can see what topics will resonate with you. Gun control, abortion, economics. We can actually see what penetrates your brain and make you care. And this becomes a really powerful tool for politicians to know what will change their constituents' mind. On politics still, one of the things we try to do is we try to look at the uh, uh, climate change, and we looked at uh, Al Gore giving a talk about climate change and try to see what will make people be more engaged with what he has to say. So I like Al Gore a lot, but uh, he is not known for being that engaging. In fact, uh, a friend of mine who worked at the Clinton White House told me that the joke in the White House was that Al Gore was so boring, his Secret Service code name was Al Gore. <laughs> so uh, we try to look at uh, the brains of patients I didn't make it up. Uh, we looked at the brains of patients this time who had their brain open because they were undergoing brain surgery, and we looked at the brain using electrodes that were inside their head and tried to tell them by giving them feedback what they should try to do to make Algo more engaging, and this allows us to learn actually how to tailor the messages such that it would work on most brains at the same time. But the two projects that I cared about the most were in education and in healthcare. 
In education, most times we have one person speaking to many people and we hope that their brains are gonna align. But it doesn't work like this. When I speak to you right now, I probably speak too fast for a third of you, uh, just right for a few and maybe too slow for one. Um, but that's how we have our teachers work. We just have one brain in front of another and hope that they're gonna synchronize. What if we start pairing brains so the teacher is perfectly aligned with his or her students? In Barcelona, we partnered with the public school system and we tried to give teachers real-time feedback of their students' brains so they can actually know what works and what they should focus on or maybe repeat or what they can move forward. But the most important thing we did, I think, was in healthcare. We learned from a company here in Chicago that is a big healthcare engagement uh, group that a lot of times patients leave the doctor's office, don't know exactly what to do next. They don't remember what they were told, how many pills to take, when to take them, even though it was said in the meeting. So we tried to actually help doctors get access to the patient's brains in real time and see what lands. So we make sure that they actually leave the room knowing what to do. And this improved the healthcare of this small community by 40%. Okay, so you already see all the benefits, but maybe some of you already noticed that there are a few risks here. If you can start tailoring content to brains, you don't just have marketing companies who will show you the next YouTube clip based on what people like you watched. You can actually start having people tailor messages perfectly to you. But even more risky is the fact that what we're seeing is that it turns out that when you have brains that synchronize, it leads to behavior changes. As in, when you are alike for a while, you start actually seeing the world in the same way. This creates echo chambers where people really become impervious to things that negate their views. They really see the world in a similar fashion. Now, it also has benefits. It means that if you want to change something in you, you can actually put your brain next to similar brains and it will change. So, for example, if you're always late and you want to uh, be on time, instead of just working on it, be next to people who are always on time, like Swiss and Germans, and you will start to become on time. <laughs> if, uh, if you want to be funny, instead of reading a book of 1,000 jokes, just be next to funny people and you will somehow internalize their thinking. You will learn their cues and how they work without actually knowing what you're learning. So this means that uh, engagement starts looking more like a commodity, something that we can actually figure out and align with what we want. So you can start forming teams in your workplace that would be either very similar brain-wise if you need to do something in parallel or very different if you have a creative task. And it means that we can start thinking about engagement in content in a different way that we did before, but that's not where it becomes really, really powerful and cool. The most thing that we see that I find really remarkable is that some of my colleagues figured out ways to not just look at engagement, but actually induce it. Working with animals like rats and mice and monkeys, they can actually put a wire between the brains of animals, and what they see is that they aren't just sharing thoughts, but actually start to behave as if they're one entity ignoring the fact that there used to be two. It's as if your left and right hemispheres aren't just two independent entities, but part of you. So is it that we see that synchronization in the brain makes people actually, or animals, actually behave the same. This suggests that maybe synchronization in the brain isn't just a measure of engagement, but actually a way for our collective sharing of ideas to work. So what did we learn? First, we have now a tool to look at brain similarity and in doing that, assess how engaging things come. And second, engaging things are really important in changing our behaviors. Now, this is critical because the world we live in right now is a world where engagement is required from a lot of people. Uh, companies talk about customer engagement. Uh, CEOs of companies are required to go on stage and uh, sell you the new phone on their own. Politicians are not just measured by their policies, but actually whether they're good on TV. And even professors are now asked to come on stage and give you a 12-minute talk that uh, hopefully engages you in telling you about their science in a profound way. Whether we like it or not, engagement is something that is critical right now, and we all have to be aware of that. And for the first time, we actually mint the coin of this resource. And it's important because we know that when content gets into your brain, you will believe it. We can filter it before, but once it's in your head, you will never doubt it. People never say, I'm not sure I believe my own memories or my own thoughts. In fact, my students created this t-shirt uh, that uh, we have that says, don't believe everything you think. And we know that this is really hard. So now that we have a tool that allows us to check what goes in, we can actually make sure that 
what comes inside our brain isn't changing us in ways that we don't want. Essentially, we have a tool now that allows us to make sure that our great minds are not automatically thinking alike. Thank you.